Dr. Thomas Kingsley Brown has been researching Ibogaine treatment for substance dependence since 2009, when he began conducting interviews with patients at a treatment center in Playa del Tijuana, Mexico, and collected data for the purpose of studying quality of life for those patients. In 2010, he began working with MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, on a Mexico-based observational study of the long-term outcomes for people receiving Ibogaine-assisted treatment for opioid dependence. That study is complete, and the first research article from the study has been published in the American Journal of Drug and Alcohol Abuse. It came out this year. In 2013, he published a review article on Ibogaine treatment in current drug abuse reviews. Dr. Brown's an academic administrator at the University of California, San Diego. His academic training is in chemistry and anthropology. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Neil. I'm here speaking for people who can't be here right now, so I'm very grateful to all of them. Iboga is a shrub that is native to West Central Africa, and the iboga root bark is used in initiatory rituals in Gabon and Cameroon, and it's considered a religious sacrament. Ibogaine is one of the 12 alkaloids found in the root bark, and it is considered the key psychoactive component of the plant. It's pictured here with the white capsules there, and also iboga root bark powder is pictured there. It's the brown powder, and the lower picture is a picture of the iboga root itself. I want to talk a little bit about the opioid crisis that everyone's been hearing so much about recently. Uh, recently, the uh, mortality rates from opioid overdose have surpassed the uh, rates of all the deaths for people below the age of 50 in the United States. It's become the leading cause of death for people under the age of 50 in the United States. And uh, leading the way recently are deaths from heroin and from synthetic opioids like fentanyl, which is very potent and which has been used to cut heroin to create a, a cheaper and more dangerous high. Uh, also interestingly, methadone is on that list of, of, of opioid overdose deaths. About a decade ago, the deaths from methadone actually outpaced those from heroin about two to one. Methadone is one of the most common compounds used to treat opioid use disorder, so it's interesting that it's there. Opioid mortality, this is a plot of mortality versus time for people who are opioid dependent, and what it's showing here is a plot of individuals in 28 different long-term cohort follow-up studies. So, to be clear, the lines are from 28 different studies. A meta-analysis of these studies shows that on average the uh, death rate for people who are opioid dependent is six to ten times higher than that of the general population. Another large well-regarded study showed that the use of heroin costs them about 28 to 44 years of potential life lost. Taken together, the above data suggests that the lifespan of an average opioid user is mid to late 30s with about half of that premature mortality accounted for by overdose. So it's a very serious problem. And what do we have for treatment right now? The standard treatment is opioid replacement therapy. Uh, most commonly, that's either methadone or buprenorphine, which are opioid agonists and which are, uh, like, they, like other opioids, they can, they can lead to dependence. Um, and the, the treatment depends on people ha uh, taking the, the maintenance every day for years and quite possibly till the end of their life. What these top three bullet points show is that they stop using that maintenance treatment, they're going to relapse quickly. They're going to go back to using illicit opioids very quickly. The rate of success and rate of abstinence after people stop using these replacement therapies is, is very low. That bottom bullet point shows that it's actually not easy to keep people in maintenance programs. Less than five months into maintenance, you have retention uh, percentages of 53% for buprenorphine and 63% for methadone. Uh, so, fortunately, there is a treatment that is, it only involves brief treatment periods and which does not involve replacing one addictive substance with another. And that, of course, is Ibogaine treatment, which was first discovered serendipitously by the man pictured here, Howard Lotsoff. Uh, he was 19 years old, uh, living in Brooklyn. A friend gave him some Ibogaine and said, expect a 36-hour trip. Howard took the Ibogaine and really about 30 hours later, he was walking outside his apartment and suddenly realized that even though he hadn't had any heroin for that period, he was not in heroin withdrawal. And I'm quoting from a YouTube video where he says, I stopped dead in my tracks with that realization. I stopped dead in my tracks on the street. Immediately after I realized that I was not in heroin withdrawal, I realized that my perception toward heroin had entirely changed. Where previously I had viewed heroin as a drug which gave me comfort, I now viewed heroin as a drug which emulated death.
the very next thought in my head was, I prefer life over death. Now, this was the prototypical experience of opi opioid addiction uh, interruption. Uh, that was created serendipitously for Howard Lotsoff. And he went on to become a lifelong advocate and activist, promoting research into Ibogaine's potential as a treatment for addiction and supporting more widespread availability of Ibogaine treatment. To put this all in historical context, you see there in 1962, Howard Lotsoff, New York City, discovers the Ibogaine's potential for interrupting addiction. By the end of that decade, Ibogaine was made illegal in the United States and was designated as a Schedule I substance in the U.S., therefore making it much more difficult to do any research with it and making it illegal to possess it, let alone to use it in the United States, and several European countries followed suit. In the 80s, uh, Howard Lotsoff obtained his first of five patents for uh, treatment of opioid use disorder. I'm, not sorry, I'm sorry, not opioid use disorder, but for substance dependence. The first one was for narcotic dependence, and he went on to get four other patents for uh, dependence on other uh, substance types. Uh, he also advocated for research, and, uh, on, and as a result, there were animal studies done in the late 80s and the 90s that showed that Ibogaine could reduce withdrawal-like symptoms in animals, and uh, also reduce the self-administration of drugs, uh, which is a proxy for uh, drug craving. So there are dozens of studies replicating these results in different species. Uh, interestingly, two other compounds that are related uh, very closely chemically to Ibogaine um, were also shown to have similar efficacy in these regards uh, with animals. Um, nor Ibogaine is the primary metabolite of Ibogaine, and uh, it has a much longer half-life in the body than, than does Ibogaine. 18MC is a rationally designed drug that was used, that was taking the, uh, taking the uh, Ibogaine uh, skeleton, as it were, uh, and adding a few different functional groups to it. You get 18MC. Now, there's a question as to whether or not 18MC is psychoactive. We don't know for sure because there are no known cases of humans taking it. Uh, nor Ibogaine is probably not psychoactive. Uh, there's pretty good evidence that it's not. Uh, however, uh, there was interest at that, at that time in finding a substance that wasn't psychoactive because the psychedelics had been so vilified and some people saw the, the psychoactive effects as being uh, unnecessary at best and potentially as a kind of a, a harmful side effect or, uh, at worst. By the end of the 80s uh, and into the early 90s, there was increasingly strong activism in uh, the Netherlands in particular and in the U.S., especially here in New York City, uh, towards... Uh, getting government agencies to allow uh, research into Ibogaine treatment and also to allow treatment uh, access for people. Here we see some pictures from um, Ibogaine demonstrations in New York City, 1993 or so. Uh, Dana Beal and friends, and then a man at a, an Ibogaine rally in the Bronx, the sign saying, Ibogaine testing now, behind him. By the late 80s, Ibogaine treatments had started in the Netherlands. Now, this is in the face of very little to no progress in the United States in terms of making this treatment available and legal and getting research. People started doing treatments, uh, and these were people who were uh, from addict self-help groups, as they were called at the time, uh, who were activists who wanted to provide these treatments for people who really needed them. Uh, by the late, by the mid to late 1990s, Ibogaine treatment became more and more prevalent uh, in, in different parts of the world. Uh, you see the, the countries listed there. And aside, apart from the USA, where there were underground treatments taking place, these other countries are places where Ibogaine was not at that time regulated. Here's a picture of a treatment facility. It's actually the outside of the apartment building where treatments were taking place in Rotterdam in the early 90s. That is the treatment provider on the left there, along with uh, Norma and Howard Lotsoff outside the apartment where the treatments were done. To reiterate, the people who are providing these treatments for uh, doing a, a service for people, and they were also activists in a, in a very uh, important regard. Um, Back in 2008, uh, my, my recent co-author, Ken Alper and Howard Lotsoff and Charlie Kaplan published this article called The Ibogaine Medical Subculture, which showed the growth of this, uh, what they called Ibogaine Medical Subculture. And they showed that in the early parts of the century, uh, the number of verified treatments for Ibogaine uh, had grown quite, quite a lot. That is, from 2001 with just under 900, to early 2006, where there are nearly 3,500. And the authors estimate that this is a fourfold increase relative to the prior estimate, and that's an average yearly growth, growth rate of approximately 30%, which is really, it's really flying. Uh, and at that time, this is from the same study, 
they had uh, verified 13 different sites. I also have listed the United States there with a question mark for a number of sites because there were underground treatments going on. The other sites, 13 of them in countries, again, where Ibogaine was not regulated. Fast forward to eight years later when I did a very quick and dirty study relative to that very comprehensive study which had been done. But I did a survey which found that there were at least 35 sites around the world. So going from 13 to 35 and possibly as many as 50 or even more. You can see here that Mexico really became the center of the Ibogaine treatment world uh, with about half the sites known in the world at the time. Uh, and there were countries, the ones in bold here, were countries that didn't have any treatment sites back when uh, when uh, this earlier study was done. Um, I would like to have uh, put in color, there, there were three countries at this point which had made it legal to prescribe Ibogaine. Those countries were New Zealand back in 2010, also uh, Brazil and South Africa. So you see movement being made in certain countries towards making Ibogaine treatment legal and available. Um, so why study Ibogaine treatment? Why did we do this study to begin with? Well, when I first went to an Ibogaine clinic back in 2009, there was very little published evidence that Ibogaine was effective. There were many anecdotal reports, uh, and uh, the, fact, the mere fact that thousands of people were going to these treatment sites uh, and, and reporting good results it gave you a pretty good indication that there was, there was something important going on here, but there wasn't any scientific evidence of the sort that would be necessary to convince NIDA, the FDA, scientists, and people in the medical community that Ibogaine was really effective. So we embarked upon this study, which was published earlier this year. This was a project long in the making. We published the article about seven years after I started the study, six and a half to seven years after I started the study. Um, the study had 30 individuals who had uh, opioid use disorder. Um, they averaged, uh, before coming to the Ibogaine treatment center, they averaged having 3.1 uh, prior treatments for opioid, opioid use disorder, and 97% of the people in this study had had some kind of prior treatment. Those treatments had been found to be inadequate, so they came to get Ibogaine treatment. Um, the two main measures we used were the SOWS, which is the subjective opioid withdrawal, scale uh, to measure whether or not uh, Ibogaine was effective in detox, that is, from before treatment to a few days after treatment, are we seeing the cessation of withdrawal symptoms where you would expect ordinarily to see increasing withdrawal symptoms because they hadn't had any opioids in the in intervening time. The other one was the Addiction Severity Index, uh, or ASI, and we were looking at ASI composite scores in seven different areas. We call them ASIC scores for short. Uh, I interviewed people before their treatment and then I interviewed them uh, monthly for 12 months after their treatment, and we analyzed the data at uh, time, point, time points for one, three, six, and nine, one, three, six, nine, and 12 months after treatment. And these different problem areas, including drug use severity and some related quality of life areas like uh, legal, legal status, uh, family and social uh, status, and psychiatric status. Uh, the two main questions we are posing here is, first of all, uh, is Ibogaine effective in detox? And that we're using the SOUS, as I mentioned, for that. The other main question is, is Ibogaine effective as a treatment as evidenced by scores in the ASI improving from before treatment to after treatment? And is that, st uh, that treatment effect sustained at later time points through the 12 months? And um, I'll leave it to, you can find this article online, thanks to MAPS having paid for public access for this article. Uh, but very briefly, we did find that Ibogaine is effective for detox. The SOUS score has reduced quite a lot from before to after treatment. There were reductions in opioid use. We found at one month, 50% of people in the study were abstinent from opioids in the previous 30 days. And we also found good numbers ongoing through the entire 12 months for reductions in opioid use. Also, we found long-term improvement in ASI scores, most significantly the ASI drug use severity scores, which dramatically drop at every time point after treatment as compared to the baseline. We also found that improvement, that sort of improvement, but not to the same, quite the same level in the legal uh, status and in family and social status scores. And the family and social status scores were the ones that improved second most strongly. And that's important uh, because this is what, what this is measuring is how, in, how well are people doing in their relationships with the people that matter most in their life. So what we're showing is that for 12 months after treatment, people are still, they're experiencing improved relationships with the people that matter most in their lives.
Results from other recent studies, the MAPS-funded study in New Zealand used practically the identical protocol to ours. Their main problem substance there in New Zealand is methadone. They also found a significant reduction in ASI drug use severity from pretreatment to 12 months out. In 2014, its Brazilian team published a retrospective analysis of data from 75 people, primarily cocaine users. And the ibogaine treatments here were actually done after the detox, but what they're showing in this study is that participants reported longer periods of abstinence after treatment than they did before treatment. Of course, this is great that we're showing this scientific evidence that Ibogaine is effective. Uh, but what got me really interested in this to begin with was when I first went to a clinic in Playa de Tijuana, Mexico, and started interviewing people about what their experiences were like, both their experiences with the Ibogaine, why they came to the clinics, uh, and what their, what their life was like after they, after they were treated. And, um, so what I'm going to present to you now is, is the qualitative data, which we didn't include much of at all in the article, but which to me is, is the most compelling evidence that this stuff really works and is making a difference in people's lives. I've got two kinds of data here. One's personal narratives about their life before and after Ibogaine treatment. The other one is experiential reports of the Ibogaine treatment itself. I have a great deal of gratitude for this woman. Sandy Hartman was the first person I interviewed at the clinic in Mexico when I went there in 2009. And she had driven across the country from Tennessee, sold her farm, drove across the country with her dog, Yuppie, and bought herself her treatment at this clinic for her 60th birthday. And this picture was taken within a month or two after her treatment, and that's when I met her. And she had been in an aftercare facility. She was opioid-free. And she went on to found her own treatment center, which was initially for people who wanted to have some kind of aftercare and integration work after their began treatment. The personal narratives, the patterns I was seeing in these personal narratives is that oftentimes people who come to Ibogaine treatment are suicidal when they arrive or in the, in the months preceding that. These quotes are from people I've interviewed or from the study. If Ibogaine doesn't work, I'm checking out. The people were desperate. They, they th saw this as their last hope. Uh, and they really, they really wanted to, to just check out of life if they didn't work. Uh, Max, uh, the so-called uh, the name that was given to him by the people at the, at the clinic, um, had tried to kill himself uh, by jumping off a, through a window uh, in a high rise and uh, during a board meeting. And fortunately, the, the, the window was made of very strong plexiglass and he only suffered bruises to his body and his ego. Uh, but he went, then went and got treated at the, at the clinic. Uh, but he was, he was suicidal and also threatened to kill himself when he was at the clinic. Also, people report the, that the opioids are killing them. Uh, people talked about it being a slow suicide or opioids or stealing my life. Uh, I gave up my interests. People report giving up their, the things that they used to be interested in. Along those same lines, people report being unmotivated, depressed, or numb. I had no motivation to do anything. Nothing was fun or interesting. Uh, you don't feel joy. You don't feel pain. You don't feel love. You don't feel at all. One man, uh, before his treatment, told me uh, Suboxone had been making him feel depressed. He was trying to get off of Suboxone, which is a ma maintenance treatment. Um, and um, this man I'm calling Simon, a young man from a broken home, he had uh, tried five times to kill himself. Uh, at, at a very early age, when he was in early, his early teens, his mother left the family. And then uh, his father, who was, a heroin, who was addicted to heroin, shot him up with heroin at the age of 14. Uh, he lived on the streets for many years and was a prostitute trying to get money to, to support his habit. What is the Ibogaine experience like? What can we tell from the reports as to what is going on here with these experiences? It's a physically and emotionally difficult thing, even for people who aren't trying to get off of opioids. It's a lengthy experience, physically and emotionally difficult. People do report alleviation of their withdrawal symptoms, and they also report dreamlike visions and panoramic recall sometimes of things that happened in their life. And the common experiential themes I'm going to go through one by one here. People reported insight about the roots of their addiction. I began allowed me to see what was making me so miserable. I saw instantly why I became addicted. I'd been in a tremendous emotional pain, and I was very good at intellectualizing my problems and not feeling the pain. People also report visions of an alternate present or a possible future. At the final part of my trip, I realized why I was in a self-destructive pattern. Then, for what felt like hours, I saw my future as a heroin addict. I was in and out of a prison for a long time, till I was old and decrepit and alone. I felt like I'd wasted my whole life. Then, I was under a collapsing bridge, it fell on me, and I died.
And then the man told me that uh, I began showed him that if I, he continued using the opiates, he would someday be smuggling heroin into Florida. He bought a yacht with his brother, had an affair with his brother's wife, and then murdered his brother. Uh, so uh, he didn't actually go that path. Uh, mystical experiences also re are reported. I'm going to kind of brush through this one so I can move on. But uh, these are very powerful experiences where people feel the certainty that there's a life after death or they feel certain that there are guardian angels or beings watching over them. And also very importantly, people report having regrets during their experiences, but also having experiences of reconciliation and forgiveness, both of themselves and forgiveness of people in their lives. One person says, I felt a profound sense of love for my family and their love for me, and an intense, almost piercing agony as I was overwhelmed with the remorse and the waste and loss, feeling empathy with my family over all their hopes for me dashed by my relentless pursuit of drugs. A Simon, who I mentioned earlier, uh, on the 10th day after the start of the treatment, while still at the clinic, I woke up and realized suddenly that all of my life experiences made me who I am today. And with that realization, I totally forgave my mother and my father. Uh, before I, I began, I hated my father. Now I'm thankful for all that I learned from him. Uh, he went on, he spoke with his mother briefly, after, shortly after treatment, uh, and forgave her uh, on the phone. Uh, so this is a great, a great story of reconciliation. And also, we find that people have a sense of renewal after their treatment, and the people around them see this as well. Before his treatment, my son was irritable and withdrawn. He's an entirely new person now. He tends to be in a positive, talkative mood, and we're friends now. I have my life back. My personality is back. I want to be more social again. Uh, it's like having your life handed back to you. Uh, when I detoxed, I found the real me. Um, and people also find a sense of purpose. Uh, the person I told you who tried to jump out the window of a high rise uh, went on, he, he was, his treatment was successful. He had the, the word Ibogaine tattooed on one of his forearms and went on and he wanted to tell the whole world about his, his experience. People also report having, wanting to help out at the clinic where they were treated and some people actually go on to, to form their own clinics and what you find commonly is that people who run these clinics and provide the treatment had come to it through being treated by somebody else. So they want to make a difference. Um, and people also become active in other ways, like uh, involvement with research or speaking at conferences. And this is my, my friend Sandy, the first person I interviewed. She's on stage here at a MAPS conference in 2010. The molecules were added by my friend Matt. Uh, Sandy spoke about the importance of aftercare. This young man, who's pictured with these very famous people, the Groffs on the left and with Mountain Girl on the right. And this young man was part of the study. He gave me permission to use these photos. At the time, at the MAPS conference in 2010, he was dependent on prescription opioids. Fast forward to seven years later, he looks younger. It helps that he's standing next to me, but he looks younger. The colors come back and he's smiling. And he's, he's very happy. He's at the symposia stage in the left there, and he's telling about his experiences. This young woman was not part of the study. She also gave me permission to use her photos. Juliana, this is her in 2006, shortly after she was arrested for shoplifting to support her habit. Nearly 10 years later, you see she looks younger. She looks strong, and she's sporting this... Ibogaine tattoo, the structure of Ibogaine on her left bicep. She's moderated panels at Ibogaine conferences, and she has spoken at conferences as well. Why isn't treatment available here in the U.S., and what's, what's the future of Ibogaine treatment? Well, first of all, it's illegal in Schedule 1, which poses its own barriers. But the fact that there's a stigma about the, the psychoactivity uh, is also a problem. It's kind of associated with the psychedelic 60s and with the counterculture, but also uh, scientists sometimes see that as being an unnecessary side effect and, and possibly even harmful. Um, there are risks associated with Ibogaine treatment, which I don't have time to get into, but we have to weigh these risks really against the risks of doing nothing and the risks of, of the standard treatment and also we have to consider quality of life in, the, in, the, in that mix. And also, finally, there's little incentive for pharmaceutical companies to pursue drug approval for Ibogaine. First of all, Ibogaine is a natural product. It can't be patented. And also, the treatment periods are relatively brief. It doesn't, it's not something like methadone or buprenorphine that you're going to be taking every day for the rest of your life, uh, ideally in terms of the, the pharmaceutical companies. So there's little financial incentive for them to, to pursue this. As a, as a, for, to, to, to pursue drug approval. Legislative efforts in the U.S. have been taking place in two states, here in New York and also in Vermont. But it's significant that these statewide efforts are taking place. It shows that maybe the model of medical marijuana and marijuana legalization for recreational use on a state-by-state -state basis could be one avenue for Ibogaine as well. And where I see the future of Ibogaine treatment, there are groups like the Global Ibogaine Therapy Alliance, or GITA, that provide a forum for people to come together and talk about best practices, to talk about improving safety, to talk about improving treatment efficacy, 
and to talk about what else can we be doing. There is also going to be, I think, more and more emphasis on aftercare and integration of the psychedelic experiences, which will also improve uh, treatment outcomes and quality of life for people. Uh, as for 18MC and noribogaine, uh, these synthetics which are patentable and patented, um, they may be developed, but they're currently behind ibogaine because now we have evidence that ibogaine works. Uh, also, I think that if they're not psychoactive, they're going to be missing a really key component, and I hope I've demonstrated that uh, in this talk today, that the psychoactivity is actually part of the healing, it's part of the recovery. Uh, and finally, uh, this, is, this is a worldwide movement, the Ibogaine uh, medical subculture is a worldwide movement led by activists and people who really want to make a difference. And the number of treatment sites is increasing around the world, or people being treated is increasing around the world. So this is a movement that is going to continue to grow with or without us. Thank you. I've seen that number of one in 300 people who have been treated for uh, opioid use uh, with Ibogaine uh, die in close temporal proximity. This is a, a term that uh, Ken Alper, my co-author, uh, uh, coined. And uh, so it's not clear that, that if you die after, after you've had the Ibogaine, it's because of the Ibogaine itself. But there are some risk factors associated with Ibogaine treatment. It increase, increase, increases something called the QT uh, interval. It slows your heart rate down. Um, and there have been fatalities at, at clinics. And um, there are ways to make the treatments much safer. There are people who have done thousands of treatments without having any adverse events. Um, there are doctors who have provided thousands of treatments. Uh, and so I don't see Ibogaine treatment as a last resort because uh, people who are, who are receiving standard treatment are not in a very good situation. If you talk with someone who's on methadone long term or on Suboxone long term, they just want to get off this stuff. They don't want to use it anymore for the most part. And some, it helps some people and it's very effective for some people, but it's not effective for everybody and not everyone can, can maintain that. Uh, and even if they do, their quality of life might suffer. And as I mentioned earlier, methadone is also uh, quite deadly. So I don't see it, Ibogaine as being any more risky. In fact, I think it's a lot less risky than doing nothing. And I think it's less risky than not providing this treatment option for people. The best evidence we have for long-term outcomes is from the, the, this study that, that I did and also the one from New Zealand. But as far as uh, long-term effects from Ibogaine treatment, I, there isn't anything I've seen uh, you know, to indicate there are any adverse effects or but, uh, you know, positive effects clearly in terms of uh, drug use uh, reduction and in terms of quality of life. Uh, but um, it's a treatment that tends to be very brief and sometimes people will go back for a second or even a third treatment or they'll do what's called taking a booster. They might have small doses uh, daily for a period, it might microdose after their, after their initial treatment. Uh, and uh, so there's, no, there's nothing to show that, uh, that there's any adverse effect from having repeated treatments from Ibogaine. Yes, I think so. Uh, there is a tendency to see addiction as a, a physical problem, as a disease entity, um, and to not see it as a psycho-spiritual uh, issue. And so the treatment tends to be something that's going to be treating the body, treating the brain, uh, and not treating the psycho-spiritual aspects of, of, of a, people, a person's life. So, um, yeah, that's why, and the, you know, as... As I've seen, the scientific community, a lot of people tend to kind of have this very reductionist viewpoint. Oh, if it works in animals as well as this other stuff, then it must be good in humans. You can't really make that, you can't really make that leap. Uh, and um, yeah, it's, uh, there is a tendency to just see things as being very, uh, very biochemically driven and that that's all you have to take care of is things at the pharmacological level and not really deal with the psychological and spiritual.
Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and this is recognized in the Ibogaine community as well. I've gone to conferences of uh, the Global Ibogaine Therapy Alliance. There was recently a, a conference in Vienna. Um, and this is recognized as a, as, a, as a problem. That is, people go to the clinics, usually they're flying thousands of miles. They go to, to another country. They get a treatment which might last five days to a week and then oftentimes they're going right back home. And so it's difficult to have any kind of follow-up with people and the, the treatment sites are doing the best they can to provide good treatments, but it's difficult to follow up with everybody. And I agree with you fully and there's a broad agreement that we really need to have uh, professionals who are trained in uh, psycho psychedelic integration and in uh, addiction recovery and uh, all, all of the above to help people integrate their experiences and also to help people maintain and grow with what they've, they've experienced from the Ibogaine. Yeah. I want to point out that you know, the research with MDMA, uh, the researchers get annoyed if you say MDMA therapy and they say, no, no, MDMA assisted psychotherapy. And it's part of the research protocol, it's built in. So they're not really studying the drug alone, you know, they're studying it in, in, with, like integrated into the psychotherapy process. Yeah, the fact that, uh, that Ibogaine has these two, well, the addiction recovery has these two main pieces, as I think it's seen, that is, you have to detox from the stuff. You have to be able to interrupt that ad ad addiction. And then there's the work of, of ongoing, ongoingly working with whatever demons you have, with whatever things came up in the, in the Ibogaine session, and with, uh, with tackling the things that led to your addiction in the first place. The person who's best equipped to answer that in the world, and might be here in the audience, is Dr. Ken Alper here. Uh, he, he may well be here. At any rate, I can begin to answer that question, and that is, it seems like there's something pharmacologically going on here. Um, Ibogaine is unlike the other substance, psychedelic substances which are used to treat addiction, like psilocybin, ketamine, in that it does cause this great reduction and sometimes complete cessation of withdrawal symptoms. And it seems to also have an effect on drug craving. Uh, we haven't seen that with other, subs other substances. So it, it's not understood what's going on with Ibogaine. It's a very kind of dirty drug in a way because it hits all the receptor sites. It hits, it's, it's all over the place. It's not an opioid agonist. It, it hits all these many different receptors and it has activity all over the place. And it's not really understood despite all these animal studies that have been done. We don't know what's going on biochemically with it. Uh, so with regard to the mechanism of action of Ibogaine in opioid detoxification, Ibogaine is not an opioid agonist, we know that, so it's not imitating the effects of a methadone or buprenorphine taper. It is effective in the animal model, which would rule out the interpretation that it's totally psychologically mediated, uh, because the animals get relief from that, and presumably that's not on the basis of their interpretation of their subjective experience. Um, <clears throat> the most important thing is that we don't know what the Ibogaine's mechanism action is in opioid detoxification, and that is the main reason to study it. It has been helpful for people in reducing their depression. The New Zealand study showed this in their data. The back depression scores went down from pre-treatment to post-treatment. Our data was a little, it was right around 0.05 significance level. Um, we didn't present that data for various reasons, but it seems to have some effect on, on reducing depression. Uh, also, it's, uh, there is anecdotal evidence that it may be helpful for, uh, for uh, Parkinson's. So that's a really interesting avenue that I don't know enough about it to be able to say, is this real or not, but there are people who, who are sure that this is really working for people with Parkinson's. Here in the United States, there is, there's uh, Vermonters for, uh, for Ibogaine treatment, I think it's called. There's a, a group in, in, in Vermont uh, led by Bonnie Scott um, who are advocating for providing Ibogaine treatment or funding for research in Vermont. Uh, there are other activists here in New York who are advocating for uh, research and also for the availability of treatment. And so there are people doing this work who aren't directly involved with, uh, with Ibogaine treatment, uh, but I'm not 
all that well equipped to, to tell you many, many, many of the details on that. Here in the United States, any treatments that are being done are being done underground because it's illegal to do it here in the States. Um, however, there are people who, and there is, there is somebody who, again, is from New York City, um, who has uh, gone through the, the Bwiti initiation and who incorporates uh, Bwiti-type ritual in his treatments. Uh, so there is some work like that being done, and we actually, there are some people who are from West Central Africa who, are, who have been initiated as, as people in that tradition who provide treatment for people. Um, unfortunately, there is, no, uh, there is no research that's been done on that. As an anthropologist, I'm pretty sure that when you include, when you focus on the ritual context and when you look at set and setting and you try to maximize the, the, the you try to optimize those for, for treatment efficacy, I think that there is going to be some, some benefit shown there by including ritual. So, so yeah, I'd like to see more of that and I'd like to see some research being done on that as well. You were referring to Dimitri, I think? Yes, Dimitri Mugianis, yeah. D you know, yeah. Dimitri spoke here at Horizons, ah, okay. but he did go back and get full training and he became a, a, a Bwiti a priest. The clinics, for the most part, aren't incorporating any of this traditional understandings about how Iboga is, is to be used and administered and, and how to work with the experiences. Uh, so that's a, an, an area where there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of exploration that can be done there. So really there's no point. Takiwasi in uh, Gabon? No, there's no Takiwasi. Not that I, not that I know of anyway. And I think I, yeah. We would probably know. So, okay, thank yeah. you. Most commonly, when people are going for uh, treatment of uh, substance dependence, they're going in for opioid dependence. Uh, but sometimes people will go in for dependence on other substances, sometimes alcohol, uh, sometimes uh, uh, methamphetamine, uh, and there's less evidence about how well it works with these other, other substances. Anecdotally, I have heard that people have stopped smoking cigarettes, they've stopped uh, consuming alcohol, um, and um, the, the Brazilian study was for cocaine users, but it was after they detoxed. It does not look like, uh, like Ibogaine can help you with the withdrawal symptoms for cocaine. I'm not sure, though. There, there's some evidence of that, now that I think about it. Uh, Deborah Mash's team at the University of Miami showed that uh, cocaine cravings were reduced after treatment with Ibogaine, so there's some evidence that it can reduce cravings at the very least. Uh, and um, some of the, the best treatment providers, uh, Jeff Callett, who's in, uh, who's in Florida, uh, suggests that it doesn't work for benzodiazepines. Um, it, he's, he suggests it doesn't really work for alcohol. Um, there's uh, there's a, a bit of a, I guess, a difference of opinion in, 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 with some of the other substances, but clearly it's working well for opioids and quite possibly for other substances as well. Thank you, Tom.